Um, so yeah, welcome. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Beth Lormer. I'm the Ecological Justice Program Coordinator at Kairos Canada. And I'll be the, the host and facilitator of tonight's discussion. Um, I thank you all for, for being here, for taking the time out of your, your busy schedules to, to be in community um, on this conversation. Um, and for those who are going to share, thank you for, for preparing some, some reflections to share with the group tonight. I'm going to begin with a, a land acknowledgement. Um, and this land acknowledgement, uh, I give uh, credit and gratitude to my colleague, Connor Sarazen, who wrote it. And I'll share that now. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the Indigenous people across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of this land of, on which we stand, I acknowledge the land of the Huron-Wendat, Seneca, Patoon, and the Mississaugas of the Credit Indigenous Peoples, where I am right now. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet, we acknowledge the land. Our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree, the Métis, the Dene, the Soto, and Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all nations that came before us and those yet to come. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. And I thought to, um, to start us off, this is a, a nice small group and um, I may get in a moment uh, um, uh, well, I think I will leave the introductions in the chat and that way when people maybe when people speak up later, um, they can they can just uh, to say who they are um, as they speak. But I thought um, just as a time of kind of community and bringing us together um, and maybe shedding whatever um, we were, we were doing today, um, kind of leaving that and entering this room together that we could start with uh, a brief meditation. And um, I'm bringing this meditation to you. Uh, it's part of a, a new resource, contemplative resource that was developed by For the Love of Creation, um, developed by uh, a young woman called Anna Bigland Pritchard um, called Creation Care as Self-Care. And this is an audio meditation file that she created for us, but I'm going to, um, to just to just read it and share it with you with you now. Um, and it's just a, a kind of brief prayerful mindfulness exercise that's inspired by the wisdom and interconnectedness of trees. And it's to bring us all into deeper awareness of our bodies, spirits, and connection to one another. So I invite you to find yourself um, you know, sitting with your feet um, or another body part feeling kind of connected to the ground or the floor beneath you. And uh, you can close your eyes or focus um, on something uh, in your room or outside your window. Imagine roots growing from your feet down through any floors of your building, down into the deep ground and reaching out to connect to the precious roots of everyone else here today in this Zoom call. We may seem to be disconnected physically, but we are in fact still together and connected in our spirits. Remember that roots send and receive nourishing nutrients. What do your roots need today? What nutrients can you offer? Feeling yourself rooted in love, I invite you to breathe in a slow, grateful sip of wonderful air and find any pitch to resonate on it can be the same note as mine, if my voice doesn't crack, <laughs> or a different one. Just let that breath out. God be in my head and in my understanding. God be in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking, God be in my heart and in my loving. 
May your mercy fall upon us. May your healing grow within us. May your beauty overwhelm us so that we may know your grace here on this land, here on this acre of God's love. Amen. Great. So uh, thank you again for, for joining me in that brief moment of, of pause and for again for joining tonight. Um, this event is part of uh, Cairo's Climate Action Month, um, which I hope you are all engaged and participating in um, already. We're halfway through the month. Um, we started Cairo's Climate Action Month in 2019 to galvanize more awareness and action after the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's 2018 report um, and other urgent UN special reports on the climate crisis and wanting to bring a little bit more focused attention in our work to, to, to raising awareness um, and it's the impacts of climate change on vulnerable communities, especially women and Indigenous peoples. So each day in September, we've been sharing uh, information on a topic related to climate change on the website with blogs and with the goal of nurturing um, both personal gifts and, and motivating and inspiring daily practices for taking action for the climate. Um, the month is centered on uh, weekly themes and uh, those weekly themes have we've been sharing supporting resources, videos, events, uh, links to other partner organizations and their, their reports and their resources as well. And we aim to, throughout the month, aim to highlight the work of Kairos member churches, feature stories from our global partners, and showcase communities that are taking concrete steps to address the climate crisis. And the reason for this gathering tonight is to do just that, that last part, to showcase local work that people in the Kairos network are taking to address climate change, um, to, to learn from one another and to hopefully um, uplift e each other in this work. So um, tonight we're going to first hear from some speakers, some Kairos friends from across the country who will share their work in uh, local, local climate campaigns and uh, actions. And the, all these actions and campaigns are varied and it is just a reflection of the fact that responding to climate change requires all hands on deck um, all manner of skills and talents and resources and interests and connections. And uh, we all have a role to play based on what we can bring to the table. So the, I think the, the various campaigns we'll hear from are, are just a testament to, to the diversity of, of things we need to bring to the table to address climate change. After we hear um, those reflections, we'll take a few moments to um, if there's any specific questions for the, the speakers who kind of share their reflections. Um, and I think we're a small enough group that if people have questions during presentations, they could probably just drop them in the chat and hopefully people will respond right away. Um, or we can work uh, on responding to your questions. And then we'll move in just to a broader discussion with everyone gathered. Um, and I have a few questions prepared for that, but I, I welcome you to share insights from your own work at that point and offer any questions uh, for this broader discussion to, to the larger group. Um, it, is, it is really a time for all of us to, to benefit from, so um, I encourage you to, to engage in whatever way you find you can, can lean on this group um, for your own learning. Um, so uh, feel free to, to just ask me anything in the chat throughout that throughout the presentations and um, we can get to those during the discussion. All right, so we are first gonna hear from um, some of our Kairos friends across the country. Uh, I think I am gonna start in the East. Um, I, I was wondering if I should just do it randomly, but then I thought a bit of order might be helpful for myself. So <laughs> um, I think we're gonna start with, with Marianne, if that's all right. Um, Marianne is an Anglican church minister and uh, was coordinator on break of coordinating um, the, uh, the Diocesan Environmental Network uh, for the Anglican Diocese of Nova Scotia and PEI. And uh, I'll, let her, I'll let her introduce more on that. 
Yeah, thanks, Beth. Uh, yeah. I, actually, I'm still doing this. I'm still in the coordinator's, a coordinator's position um, with what we call DEN, the Diocesan Environment Network. Um, it's uh, morphed over the past 10 years from being initially the, the, uh, the bishop asked for a task force or task group, and I thought, oh yeah, a bunch of meetings and get nothing done uh, with people who don't really want to be at the meetings and burning up fossil fuels to get to the meetings. So anyway, we formed a network instead. And uh, one of my biggest problems, it's a great one, is uh, we have uh, so many people joining and connecting with this network that, um, that we have a hard time keeping up. We have three coordinators now. Uh, it's almost 10 years old. And so we'll have a 10th anniversary in the spring. But, uh, you know, when I looked at the, uh, and so I have taken on a full-time interim ministry project as well, just to prevent boredom. And uh, yeah. And one from is the experience with Dan. Uh, in order to be able to build this vibrant ministry, because I believe that this is the church in the 21st century. Um, so what the, you, I'll, if I base this on your questions, Beth, um, it, you know, the first question was, what actions have we been involved in in the community? And we have taken a real cast your net wide approach to this. Um, we have been involved in everything from fracking to deforestation, to gold mining, to fisheries, to First Nations uh, fishery uh, by default, um, to you name it, we've done it, renewable energy. Um, and so in spite of the fact that my vision at the beginning 10 years ago had been that this would be a group that would encompass all Anglicans, it's turned out to be mostly Anglicans, mostly from Nova Scotia and PEI, uh, but we've been able to make connections with every, almost every environmental group in the uh, diocese, secular environmental group, as well as connecting with international groups and national groups. So that sounds like a lot of work and it was, um, but it's more of a less focused and more community development kind of approach that has really paid off because not only, uh, you see, I'm wearing my shirt and collar tonight for a reason, uh, because eight, seven, eight years ago when the government held a, a fracking a consultation on fracking, I went to that meeting of 350 people in Windsor, Nova Scotia, and the first question I was asked and asked a number of times is, are you lost? And they couldn't believe that the church was really interested in caring about creation. And I speak about the church in the broadest sense. I don't just refer to Anglicans. And so all of a sudden, we've got this great reputation and we've got such an incredible reputation now within environment groups, at least in the Maritimes, that, um, that the church is now, you know, like it, it's kind of, it's, it's reduced that suspicion of the church and it's made the church relevant for people who aren't necessarily connected with the church at all. Um, but it's developed a sense of trust. I remember walking behind a couple of people at a meeting with Extinction Rebellion, because we have a great, a great relationship with Extinction Rebellion. Um, walking behind two people after lunch as we were headed back to the meeting and one said to the other, oh, go to the Anglicans, they'll do anything for you. And so we've developed, one of our goals has been to not, we don't pick the actions. We don't pick the uh, issues. What we do is we broadly support all of the different groups within the region and beyond and try to find ways of supporting them. So if people have an aspiration around the environment, then we want to support that. And yeah, you're right, Beth, they bring different gifts and talents and interests to the table. Um, so we don't, we didn't just abandon 
Anglicans, we are holding a symposium in the fall on, on greeting churches. But it cut me off when I've, I've spent my time here <laughs> too. I could go on for an hour. Um, but we, you know, when there's a demonstration, they call on us. When there's any kind of a particular action, a petition, um, like Owl's Head, there's a park that the government is going to sell to um, developers for golf courses. And it's a beautiful piece of land uh, that's very much natural habitat. And so we do what we can. So we have a Facebook page that they can advertise through. We have an e-news e that we, they, can, they can promote the issues through. We, can, we work our, our best to get uh, Anglicans and others who are connected to our net, those 600 and whatever people they are, um, to sign on to petitions, to attend uh, demonstrations, to uh, develop, and, and we've developed real relationship again with those environmental groups. So, so some of our people, a lot of our people have no connection to the church other than this, but they've connected to us because they, like I say, can trust us and they know that we'll come through. Um, what I'm trying to think of what the other questions were. Um, strategies, that's basically our strategy. And yes, there has been success because all of the time people are connecting with our network. And so on our Facebook page, we don't have to come up with posts. They do it for us. And so I just get to look all day to see how many different people have posted on our Facebook page, how many different people have asked us to do various things and actions. And it's everything from the Canadian Food Grains Bank and some of their actions, church groups uh, to, you know, and, and our, one of our job is teaching, providing platforms for people who are experts on their issues so that they can talk about those issues and educate people. So we have a Thursday evening thing every Thursday evening for this is like our fourth season or something by Zoom. And we get people from Vancouver and beyond to come to these things. Everybody's welcome. And it's the idea is we can share information. So we share information on things like green burial. Um, but also, you know, the fisheries, deforestation, whatever those, those hot issues are. Um, and where do I feel hope? I feel hope in every single person I encounter who cares about this planet. It's that simple and I'm surrounded by them. And that's a miracle and a blessing. Anything else you'd like to know? <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's wonderful. Thanks, Marion. Um, I'll maybe just uh, ask if there's any immediate questions for Marion right now. I think you ended on a really nice note, Marion. So that's great. Ah, Janet. Well, they oh. asked me, they asked me to be the last speaker uh, during the Paris COP conference. Uh, during a demonstration in Halifax, and they called because they said, you're a priest, you should be able to deliver a message of hope. We don't want people paralyzed, demoralized. We mm -hmm. want people to leave with hope and feel energized in action. And so it really was a lesson for me in the type of uh, ministry that the Environment Network involved itself in. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. A larger lesson for all of us, I think, in that too, as people of faith. Um, Janet, you had a question. Yeah. Hi, Marianne. Hi. And others. I'm just I'm interested about your Thursday evening um, event on on uh, Zoom. And is that something that you've just started over this past year and a half, or had you been doing it before? Okay. Like Okay, so you're just doing it, and I'm wondering if there's any kind of um, uh, format or um, um, agenda to it other than the teaching part. Like, do you perform any other kind? What's the um, the uh, structure for the um, time together? 
One of the big things about the Environment Network is our lack of structure. We really try hard not to have any. Um, and so that's why we're open to all of the diverse things that happen. Um, and a lot of them are. One of the stars of the show is the Thursday evening sessions. And so what we do is we try to make them, uh, the Nova Scotia Environmental Network calls them coffee houses. They have the same format, just happened that way. Um, but we have a guest who comes and gets the first round of speaking like I did tonight. And then it's not followed up by Q and A, it's followed up by a conversation. You know, we try our best, people slip into uh, the whole Q and A highly structured thing, and that's okay if they do, and that's fine. Um, they can have, they can bring a PowerPoint, they can bring a video, they can bring anything they want to it. This is like I say, we started. Yes, we started with the pandemic. Like everything else, we had to like immediately uh, be able to adapt to technology because of not being able to see each other, and it's been an incredible blessing for us. But yeah, so we just kind of pick people to come like we have simon chambers from action by churches together coming this thursday to talk about the cop conference in edinburgh and to talk about acts involvement in this last like who did we have last week um we had oh a man in the region who has written a book, uh, What Really Counts. He's an economist who looks at economy in a very different way from the, you know, the capitalistic society kind of, of economy. And so we, and we had one who talked about blue whale poo and the importance of blue whales. So, and so um, we get a, we try to make the topics interesting, engaging. We have First Nations people come and talk about the wisdom of caring for creation. And, uh, and so we bury the topics and, but we try to keep it as casual as possible, Janet. And everybody's welcome. I, I, um, I get, it sounds interesting. I'm, I gather somebody's a host though, right? Uh, yeah, um, Nancy Blair, who also is a specialist in ecological grief um, and a coordinator for the Environment Network, is generally the host. And I do a very short reflection that's very faith-based at the beginning, but it ties into whatever the subject of the day is. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay, well, I think I'm going to... Um pass it on to our next speaker. It'll keep things rolling. Um, so now we're going to move uh, westward and uh, Brian McIntosh is going to speak next. Um, Brian is a member of Kairos West Toronto or Toronto West, I think is how we are supposed to say. <laughs> um, and I'll let him uh, take it away. Great, thank you, uh, Beth and Marion. It's great to hear that uh, the church is turn to for a message of hope. Uh, that's fantastic, um, given the relationships you've made. Um, yeah, I represent uh, Kairos Toronto West. We've been a group that's been together for a long, long time. Um, a little bit of a dwindling membership, but having said that, uh, we've been rejuvenated in the last couple of years with two or three new members, including a new chairperson. Uh, where I, I had a stint for a while and so on. Others uh, moved away uh, or got frail uh, as they grew older. Uh, but we uh, have a, a young dynamic uh, chair uh, now and, and she's rejuvenated the group a little bit. Inspired uh, by the For the Love of Creation campaign and materials, we wanted to uh, do a local workshop. We do... Uh, in non-COVID times, we've been doing two workshops a year and we get 70 or 80 people attending uh, on a regular basis in the spring and fall. And uh, on various topics, obviously related to Kairos work, but um, we wanted to try to do a, a workshop after a bit of a hiatus during the early parts of COVID. And uh, this past spring, we planned to uh, try to do one. And despite the uh, COVID challenges, we formed a small planning group. And uh, we had the brainstorm to um, try to reach out to other local uh, environmental activists, uh, climate change activists, because uh, beyond the church, we wanted to reach uh, the public. 
and uh, sort of the, a more general audience than just uh, church folks. And so we, uh, I got to know a little bit a uh, local transform TO volunteer who's uh, our Etobicoke Ward 2 climate champion here in Etobicoke. This is with the city of Toronto, the major, uh, major campaign that uh, they're putting a lot of emphasis on over the next number of years. I had met him in early 2021 and uh, with him and some others that he brought in and then some other people that I knew in our local community, I, we formed together a climate action group which was the first of its kind in central Etobicoke. So this, what I'm gonna tell you from here on out isn't just about Kairos Toronto West, but is about this Etobicoke Climate Action Group. And we had a few meetings um, and formed a, a group that was gonna work on the workshop uh, for which Susan James was the main leader. And she's a former Kairos uh, volunteer and staff person, actually, in the national office. So we're gifted with her presence. Um, we planned and delivered an educational event uh, on Zoom on June the 3rd. And about 50 people attended, which was decent. It wasn't great, but it was decent. Um, and, and it was certainly well worth it with the feedback that we got from the attendees. Um, and the attendees included many of our sort of usual suspects who would come to our, our non-COVID workshops, you know, our non-Zoom in-person workshops. Um, we gave a little bit of ground in the planning because it was a partnership with a number of other people and organizations and not just a faith-based group. We uh, gave a little bit of ground on wanting to use some of the Kairos learning material from those three excellent uh, For the Love of Creation workshops. And um, much of the material though, uh, within those workshops was still used to one degree or another. Um, and this was a, the first of what we planned to be a, a number of workshops over time. So the workshop was called Transform Etobicoke. And the focus was on local solutions and finding local solutions. And we included sort of five parts to it, a general overview on the climate crisis called Challenge, Choice and Change by Lynn Adamson, delivered by Lynn Adamson of Climate Fast. Some of you might know Lynn. An introduction, secondly, to Transform TO and what uh, the city is trying to achieve through that program by the champion for our award, Brian McLean. Uh, the third part, a green home retrofit presentation by a local energy expert who has completely converted his urban home. Uh, Bob Bates is his name. He's worked in the energy uh, sector and has actually been a consultant to the Ontario government. He really knows his stuff. And he's converted his own home to uh, about a 15 or 20% of, of what the energy that he was consuming prior to the conversion. And it's all solar and, and so on and so on. Many, many different things. I can't describe them all because I'm not the expert, but a fantastic uh, uh, hearing from him. And then we had a discussion on waste reduction from a local Rotarian who is also a waste management uh, company uh, owner uh, called Clean Farms. He's the executive director, Barry Friesen. But he was using Ribfest as an example. Uh, some of you might know about Ribfest across the country. And uh, they, they generate tremendous amounts of waste over a week, a week, 10 day period. And they reduced it by about 75% uh, under his direction uh, when they last ran it in person it was three years ago, or two years ago, I guess it was. Um, so he talked about that. And then lastly, a brief presentation on Art for the Planet, a program of a local art center uh, near uh, my church uh, by Carol Essex. Uh, we benefited for this workshop from the expertise of a local um, technical activist who is a staff person for LEAD now. I don't know if you know uh, Tim Ellis, but he's a wonderful guy. And he was our technical expert. And uh, our chair, Jan Hurd uh, of the Kairos Toronto West Group and myself introduced the whole workshop 
and then Brian McLean of Transform TO uh, kind of hosted most of it. Uh, the workshop included breakout rooms, a Q&A, and so on, a closing which foreshadowed the formation of an even wider etopical, uh, complete etopical-wide climate action group. So we now have an etopical climate action group that has got like a membership of, uh, I don't know, I think there's 80 people on the list or something that's growing all the time, and uh, a lead group of about 10 or 12. Uh, myself included, that, that kind of try to guide the work of this uh, new group. And um, another thing we did just recently was the uh, the uh, hosting of a, a leaders debate, uh, candidates, all candidates debate on the environment uh, that was hosted by that group um, this last uh, Friday, I think it was last Friday. And uh, we had four of the five candidates. The conservatives don't seem to be showing up in any of the writings for candidates' meetings, but uh, we didn't have them, but we had the other four. And uh, um, it was really, really good. And about 150 people attended that, which was great. Um, and we have a plan, as I said, to continue with the, um, with the other uh, workshops that we want to do kind of building one on each other and trying to gain more of an audience for Tobacco, trying to establish some local um, momentum for local solutions. This is uh, our emphasis. And we'll be meeting on Monday. I, along with a couple of others from that Tobacco Climate Action Group, are meeting with our two local city councillors to talk about the Transform TO program and also to um, introduce ourselves to them and let them know that we're watching them <laughs> and that we're uh, expecting action uh, on uh, the climate um, uh, uh, by the city of Toronto. So, um, you know, where, where do we gain hope? I think that there's, it's interesting that we form this partnership. You know, COVID's been a big challenge to all of us. And we're not all that technologically adept, but Tim, uh, led us through and, and we did a, a nice job of that workshop and we want to do more. Um, but the development of partnerships, I think, was the key factor in the success, not only for this workshop, but for, for the development of this group, obviously. And it enabled us to uh, envision working on climate change for the sustainable future, not just by a few of us, but by more and more of us. Um, in our local area. Um, in fact, I'm missing an Etobicoke Climate Action Meeting tonight to be with you to give this little presentation. Um, and I think partnerships, uh, the development of partnerships provides the kind of energy and boost that you need um, when you begin to despair about any action being taken on a consistent level uh, by our leaders. and. Uh, there's many, many people out there beyond the church, but um, who also are glad to see that the church is, is committed and involved. Uh, as Marion said, I think that provides a, a kind of ear in the community that maybe we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and I, I think that uh, those partnerships are really key to uh, building the momentum that we need, especially in a big city like Toronto to be able to lobby for the work that we need to get done. Um, and it helps us avoid despair, obviously, you know, to connect with each other. Uh, lastly, I'd just say success is hard to measure, um, but feedback uh, was positive and encouragement uh, is uh, plentiful. And uh, we've made lots of connections with lots of people. Um, as I said, a growing membership in this group. So, um, Hyros is alive and well, and, and looking forward to uh, doing more on, on this uh, this collective action. I, I you know, I'm happy to. I'm, I'm going to close it, but that's enough. And uh, I'd be happy to hear any comments. As well. Great. Thank, thank you, Brian. And yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take a question. I just wanted to, to uh, note first, uh, or just to send you some, um, 
some courage uh, for your meeting with counselors. Um, other people on this call may not know uh, that the two counselors he's referring to are ones that are not open to talking about climate change <laughs> normally. They were the two that, that voted against uh, the fossil fuel proliferation Gee, in the yeah. city of Toronto. Uh, yeah. Interestingly enough, I have a uh, the only two <laughs> a long time relationship with Stephen Holiday, who's my counselor. <laughs> And uh, he's very supportive of a few other social justice things, right? He's a fiscal conservative, but he cares about people. Um, whether he cares enough to change his tune on the environment uh, remains to be seen. But I, I'm hopeful that our knowing one another might um, begin to sway him when he knows that I care deeply about this as well. We'll see. Yeah, well, thank you for those those efforts to connect. Um, those conversations are important. Um, Marion, did you have a question? A comment? Uh, yeah, I was trying to decide whether or not I should ask it or, or just uh, type it. But Brian, I really picked up on the art thing because Dan has uh, what we call the Hope and Inspiration Gallery of the Arts. Oh, great. And, it, and so I'm thinking that it would be really nice to have a conversation with you one on one at some point about how we might be able to promote your artists and perhaps we could re you could reciprocate, um, but we could get a lot more exposure. And the whole idea is that if people fall in love with nature, then they're going to care for it. Right. Right, and I'd be so, happy to have that conversation after this. Uh, yeah, today. yeah. Our, the main person for that was a member of the local art uh, art center who uh, has been a long time member there and cares deeply about the environment and became active on our group. And she brought the idea for this part of the workshop and it was really good. So yeah. I connected so, with her and, and try to have a three-way maybe. Oh, great. Sounds like a good idea. Wonderful. Um, that's great. I, I'll, I'm going to keep things moving, but if, if there's any other questions for Brian, maybe just uh, pop them in the, the chat and he can, uh, he can respond to them. Um, and we can always revisit um, some of those the things that Brian talked about um, in our big discussion. Um, but I'm going to now pass things over to uh, Elizabeth Stell and John Lawson. Um, who are uh, with Kairos Guelph. So Elizabeth is the local rep for Kairos Guelph and, um, and John is a, a United Church Minister and a member of Kairos Guelph and I'll let them take it away. Well, I, I guess I could start. Um, um, and then maybe I'll, I'll, we have two projects to, to report on. And maybe I'll start with the gas plant one because uh, Brian just referred to it. It also is, builds on the theme of uh, networking, um, which seems to be a common theme happening here. Um, anyways, just to give some context for, for, for people outside of Ontario, the, the provincial liberals uh, closing of all the Ontario's uh, coal-fired generation plants was completed in, in 2014 and, and was and maybe still is the lar a single largest emissions reduction project in North America. And the, that Liberal government also strongly encouraged renewable energy. But in 2018, the Conservatives under Doug Ford were elected and immediately spent 230 million to cancel 750 provincially sponsored renewable energy projects, including some that were almost completed. And they now plan an expansion of gas-fired power plants. And these plans will cancel out a large part of the improvements from the coal plant closings. So the, and the severity of, of national, natural gas emissions approaches that from coal because of production and transport emits a lot of methane. So then as Ontario's clean energy, or clean electricity gets dirty, it becomes much harder to reach the net zero through electrification. So that's the background. And th so this undermines the ability of Ontario cities, including Guelph and all the other ones, to reach their goal of net zero emissions by 2050. And there's a, a, a group called the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, which is an NGO that led the campaign for the coal plant closings. 
they work with local councilor NGOs, citizens and allies to encourage city council motions that urge the provincial government to phase out the gas plants by 2030. There are clean alternatives. There's the, there's the cheap, clean hydro from Quebec. There's, uh, if we had a renewed push on renewable energy sources, and then there's a huge potential for conservation because we, we waste maybe about two thirds of the energy we consume. Over the years, Kyle Squals has been involved with other climate actions and networks. So, so it's kind of built on some of the, uh, some of the actions that, that Brian and Marion have been speaking about over the, over the years. So we were invited uh, to meet with potential delegates to make sure all the points were covered at the council meeting. And then an allied councillor brought forward the motion. And then in my presentation to council, we I discussed how climate change undermines the city's vision of prosperity and, and Kyle's quest for social justice and how the city's strategic plan includes an action to advocate for provincial regulation and federal for, uh, regulations and policies aimed at, at reducing carbon emissions. So that matches the motion. But I was just one of 12 delegations. Many were high school students and there were other NGOs involved in that climate action. And Jack Gibbons from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance told us that none of the other 10 municipalities to date had any delegations other than him. And he also noted, he quote, he'd never heard before so many uniformly excellent deputations to municipal council. So that was probably, we had a sort of the strategy meeting beforehand and that, that probably helped us kind of spread, make sure we covered all the bases. After a couple of hours of council discussion, the motion was passed 11 to one. And since then, many other municipal councils have passed similar motions, including Toronto. Again, most of them either unanimous or, or almost unanimous. So I think as has been, has been discussed, it's certainly the lessons involved, the power of, of networking. I think another one which maybe fits into the hope businesses is the inspiration that, that, uh, that youth bring. Um, I think that really swayed, swayed council uh, a lot. Um, the stories and examples of hope are another source of hope, I guess, but that, that um, maybe, maybe the coal plant closings was a form of that. Um, anyway, I guess I'll turn it over to John for the uh, for other project. Maybe other folks had questions for you, Liz. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, maybe what I'll do is present as well. And, uh, and then if there's questions for both of us, I'm happy to, uh, happy to respond. Um, uh, what uh, Liz is uh, a long, uh, amazing woman uh, who has car carried the torch for uh, Kairos in Guelph for many, many years. So it feels a real privilege to be working with her on some of these things. And we decided uh, that we really like some of the love of creation material that was put out. And we thought, well, we've got to do something with this. And, and Lent seemed like a great time to have a kind of Lenten journey. So we, we did uh, a, three, um, a three evening Zoom, of course, uh, we had a hallway says right now, uh, a Zoom, uh, a presentation on each of the three uh, uh, from uh, the creation, uh, climate and us, uh, building a better future and concern from concern to action. And um, I, I was really pleased. We had basically, we, we uh, took some liberties with the, uh, the Kairos material, but we, we try to adapt it um, so that we had a section of non just the science in both cases some of the science around, um, obviously the, the science of climate change, but also some of the psychological issues uh, that, uh, that are part of that. And the Kairos material also made reference to that. And, and finally, you know, what are some signal, signals of hope as the, as the final one? 
so those were, um, that was the science part, but I, we also wanted to have a theological part. So uh, thinking of it as a Lenten journey. And so some of the understandings of how our understandings of God, for example, have broadened and changed to uh, allow us to think in new ways in relationship to the climate and uh, to the creation as a whole. So um, I, I was really, really pleased with how it went. And I think Liz was as well. And uh, uh, she presented the science part. I did the theological reflection, but we wanted to bake in each time that there was a lot of time for conversation, uh, not just on the details, but on how people were feeling. And, uh, and I think we did that. Uh, we had around a dozen, a few here above and below that uh, on uh, our nights. And uh, that, that went really well. And following up on that, we thought, well, we, we got to do some more of this. Uh, and we decided to put together a single night um, event. So we tried to collapse all this um, uh, into one session. And we did that. Uh, for Earth Day as well as um, World Environment Day. And so we, uh, it probably wasn't quite as successful. I think we tried to sit, talk too much and we didn't have the conversation that we had in the first one. But uh, nonetheless, we're, we're, we want to see if we can spread this word a little broader and it's really inspiring uh, hearing uh, uh, from uh, from Brian and Marion that, uh, you know, the, the partnerships and in expanding that dialogue. So that's a, a wonderful challenge for us. We're thinking about uh, doing um, something on YouTube where we have this, where we could package it and offer it to people. A uh, one session um, that say a church group or whatever could just use and we'll have a little pauses uh, so that it could be used as a resource anywhere across the country. So we're working on that now. That's our next uh, our next step. But uh, it's inspiring to hear what others are doing as well. Oh, right. We had we had some learnings. Sorry, <laughs> I've written a few notes here, and I realized I had forgotten to put these learnings in, which I think are important. Uh, we we were amazed uh, that how important uh, the science getting the science to people is, like. Uh, I was surprised that many people didn't have a very comprehensive view of the science. Uh, and, uh, and Liz presented so well on that um, using, again, some slides in PowerPoint uh, that I think were really, really effective in doing some really foundational education. Uh, the conversation time was really important. People wanted to talk and, uh, and they did talk and that was wonderful. Um, also, I was, uh, as a minister, I was really, really pleased that people wanted to talk about their faith in relationship to climate change and where was God in all this. And again, that ties into the hope part of, uh, of what we've already talked about this evening. And, uh, and finally, one of the learnings was that sometimes we didn't have, we had too long intros uh, at the beginning of people introducing themselves and then that sort of skewed off a little bit. So it meant that we had to scramble a little bit. So it was good to meet and get to know people along the way rather than at the beginning. So that was just a, a very practical uh, kind of learning that we that we made out of our time. But that's that's what I have. Great, thank you, John, and thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so yeah, both those are just really nice complementary pieces of of work that you've both been working on. So thank you for sharing. Um, any questions? All right. Maybe when we get this YouTube video on, yeah. uh, we can um, maybe share it with uh, this group. Maybe that that's was, possible, Jeff, I don't know. Yeah, of course, yeah. I can, I can certainly circulate that, be happy to. Um, wonderful. Okay, well, I think we'll um, we'll keep moving. Um, we have two more speakers to hear from, and then we'll open up and just to a, to a broader discussion. So um, I'm now going to pass things over to Laura Stewart, and uh, Laura is a member of uh, Kairos Regina, and she also sits on the United Church of Canada's climate advisory body. And I'll pass it over to you, Laura. Thanks, Beth. I'm going to. Uh... Just pull up my notes here and <laughs> pretend that I'm looking at you and I'm actually looking at my 